Next, in chapter 16, heeding God's word from an opened heart. In Acts 16, 14, it's so beautiful. This is such a contrast. Uh, this is Lydia, a certain woman named Lydia in verse 14. Heard of us. She was a seller of purple who worshiped God. I mean, she was someone that was very attuned. She said, I know there's a true and living God, and I know it's the one that's in this book, but she hadn't yet understood how to connect to him. And I'm afraid that's what is going on in many churches across America. They're there because they're quite interested, but they have never been born again. And that's the problem with the non-evangelical churches in America, of which more than half of them are. What's a non-evangelical church? It's a church where they don't preach that you have to be born again or saved. They just kind of act like they've always been saved. Kind of their parents were, and something happened when we were eight days old, and something else happened when we were 12, and don't bother me, I'm in. That's a non-evangelical church. An evangelical church is you were born a sinner and you continue a sinner until the moment you call in the name of the Lord and are born again. And when did that happen? And people get uncomfortable with that. They're non-evangelicals. And by the way, the word evangelical is just a Greek word that means the gospel, the good news of the gospel. So what they're saying is they're non gospely because the gospel is you're born lost and you get saved. And there's a moment, it's called the new birth. And most of us know when we were born. And the ones that don't, they keep them in special places. Either they're too little or there's something wrong. If you don't know when you were born. Yet we have churches filled with people that don't know when they were born again, the most radical transformation in the universe. And they go, I don't know. And they're not even alarmed that they don't even know. And salvation, look what happens in verse 15. It's when God does this, or verse 14. It says, and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. That's how people get saved. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You hear it, you realize it's true, and you say yes. And you reach out, you cry out, you, re you ask, you believe, you repent, you turn. You respond. That's salvation. It isn't static. It isn't kind of like it's going to happen. It's like osmosis, you know. It'll just happen. You reach out by faith. That's the gospel. And that's how it's always portrayed. She responded to the things. She heeded the things spoken by Paul. And she and her household were baptized and she begged us. Why? She heeded God's word from an open heart. The Lord opened her heart. And salvation is also, and this is the quintessential, the believe on the Lord Jesus Christ passage. In chapter 16, 25 to 34, it's to believe. Look at what verse 31 says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that's the connection to God in the Old Testament. The Lord Jehovah. Jesus, that's that man you see walking around. That's the connection. Jesus was a, a normal. I mean, there were so many people named Jesus in his day. He was 100% human, but he's the Christ. He's the one that's the fulfillment of all the promises God made. So he is God, the man, the fulfiller of all the promises, Lord Jesus and Christ. You've got to believe in him. You believe in God the Son as the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that God came down as a human. He's God the Son, and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And when you're saved, look what Acts 17 says. You start following him as the new king of your life. I mean, either you're following someone or you're not. Right? Get in your car. If someone says, let's go here to eat, follow me, you can look in your rearview mirror and either they're following you or not. And you can look at the car in front of you, either you're following them or you're not. And if you are following them, you're watching everything. You're looking to see where they're going. You're saying, no, no, don't bother me. I, want, I don't want to lose track of where they are. That's the Christian life. Following Jesus. Is Jesus out in front? Today, when you started your day, did you say, oh, okay, Lord, I want to get you out of sight. I'm following you. When you look in your rearview mirror, you can see my two eyes fixed on you. That's the Christian life. And, and look what it says. It's so interesting. It's pagans that said this. Verse 4, some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude, not a few of the leading women, joined. But, verse 5, the Jews were not persuaded. In other words, they heard what Paul said, and they didn't like it. Look what they said in verse 6. They dragged Jason and some of the rulers out of the city, or to the rulers of the city, crying out, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here, verse 7. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of our king, who is Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. The unbelievers understood that the gospel message was that you start following a new king of your life. 
and his name is Jesus. And when you follow him, you reach out to him as the true creator, and you repent of all idols. Look what it says in verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive you're very religious. And they were. Look at verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one that I'm introducing you to. Verse 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands, though he doesn't, uh, as if though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. So the God I'm introducing to you is the life giver, breath giver, all things maker. And he has come. Verse 27 so that we should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Salvation is reaching out. It, it, see, salvation is a response to God. We reach out to him. It's reaching out to God as the true creator, the one that made everything. And then look at verse 30. Truly the times of ignorance got overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He says you've got to repent of all your idols. You Athenians... You've lived your whole life. Your culture is idols. You've got you to disavow. You have to reject. You have to turn away from all those idols to the true living God. Wow. Wow.